Thank you so much, everyone, for um, coming here today and for joining me uh, in the story of Carpathian Foundation. Uh, Carpathian Foundation is an organization I'm associated with uh, for 20 years and uh, just celebrated 20th, 20th anniversary of, of its establishment. So uh, it's a very interesting and very good moment for all of us and uh, who are working with the Carpathian Foundation and we are proud of this project. Let me share you um, a snapshot of the past 20 years of, of, of life of this organization, but let me start with uh, uh, a little bit of background uh, from uh, the region where I'm coming from. Uh, the region where I'm coming from is Eastern Europe, Central and, and Eastern Europe, which went through uh, important political changes in the early 90s uh, after the uh, fall of Berlin Wall couple of revolutions and, and uh, political movements started in Eastern and Central European countries. And uh, in former Czechoslovakia, it was uh, the so-called Velvet Revolution, uh, which happened in November uh, 1989. The term Velvet, Velvet Revolution was introduced by Václav Havel, one of the leaders of the, of the revolution and one of the uh, important political players, as he was the first president of, of former Czechoslovakia. All the changes uh, brought some uh, positives and some negatives. Uh, all the changes uh, um, are usually like that, and the positives uh, which uh, appeared after the, after the Velvet Revolution were mainly connected with the freedom, freedom of speech, freedom of association. So we all uh, felt very empowered and, and uh, enriched, and, and uh, we felt like we can do, we can do anything uh, what we want. Mijar was one of the student leaders of the Velvet Revolution, so I was really living that moment uh, with, with everything which it, which it brings. Open borders, all these countries um, of Central and Eastern Europe, which belong to uh, the former communist bloc, were um, developing in uh, real isolation for the past 50 years, which means they were, the border were closed, we could move, we could travel uh, mainly to the, to the other communist uh, countries, but uh, each traveling was, was kind of struggle. The borders were really close, the waiting times were long, uh, the movement of goods was, was really problematic, so you always had to think uh, what you are buying, uh, what you are bringing to the country and whether it will be taken from you at the border or, or not. So th this has changed and this is one of the, one of the important positives. Transformation of economy. Uh, brought uh, good, uh, or I would say excellent opportunities for those who were brave and, uh, and uh, ready to, to, to start their small business or to take part in the privatization process which happened right after the, the political changes in the, in the country. Of course, everything uh, has a, a, another side. Each coin has, has two sides, so there were some challenges uh, we were facing and uh, for me the most uh, significant one uh, somehow connected with the freedom of, freedom of speech. Uh, this region is uh, inhabited by many different minorities and uh, uh, the majority of the population uh, was not very peaceful with those minorities and all these emotions and all these negative things came out after, after we, could, we could open uh, up and we could speak freely. So uh, different um, right-oriented movements uh, uh, were appearing which were contributing to the negative side of the, of, the, of the whole development. Many young people discovered that open borders uh, are helping them to move and they have plenty of other better possibilities to go and study or go and work abroad. So the region uh, I'm speaking about was uh, facing a huge brain drain and actually it's still happening mainly in those parts uh, of the countries which are far away from the capitals, which are lagging behind. Uh, the rest, uh, rest of the region, uh, those has fewer opportunities for getting good job, uh, better paid job, or, or <clears throat> the universities which are there are not that good like those ones which are, which are in the <coughs> part of, of, of Europe. So this was also something we had to face. Uh, and last but not least, social challenges. Unemployment, um, development, uh, or, or 
actually social poverty was was something we started to started to face uh, right after the changes because uh, during the, the the communist times people uh, used to be equal. In fact, nobody was really equal. But after the changes, those inequalities uh, started to be even even deeper. So all these uh, led to different initiatives, and one of those initiatives are, are somehow uh, related to Caribbean Foundation. But let me talk first a little bit about the region uh, where all this uh, was and where all this is happening, and it's uh, Carpathian Euro region. Carpathian Euro region was an initiative of uh, local and regional self-government from five uh, Eastern and Central European countries. It's Poland, Slovakia, Ukraine, Hungary, and Romania. Uh, the map uh, you can see on the slide uh, shows uh, those regions which are quite far away from the capitals, uh, uh, lagging behind the, the, the rest of the countries, having uh, less developed infrastructure, um, lower possibilities in access to, to information, education, good jobs. Um, the map shows uh, actually parts of the countries which are somehow <coughs> together and which are developing and, and they are facing, facing similar, similar disadvantages. The overall population of the region we are talking about is uh, a little bit more than 5 million people and the size, uh, just to, to, to give you an imagination, it's about the size of Great Britain. Uh, the whole project was considered to be very unique and uh, the, uh, the, the whole process of development of, of, of this uh, informal structure was facilitated by the East West Institute based in New York, uh, US. It's a think tank which was um, studying the region and uh, doing a couple of research uh, in the early 90s. And one of the most important factors uh, leading to, to this initiative was that the region was considered to be a potential area of interest in conflict. Some of the experts uh, even compared it to uh, Balkans and the former Yugoslavia. Carpathian Foundation was the next step. The region was set up. Uh, there were agreements signed between local and regional self-governments, uh, a memorandum of understanding, and the established, uh, establishing documents of the Carpathian Euro region was signed in 1993. And um, the leaders of the of the process and the leaders of the of the, of the project uh, found out that uh, there is a mechanism support all the initiatives of the people across the border and those initiatives which were, which were trying to help the, the, the local development in this very specific uh, part of Europe. So in 1994, in November, Carpathian Foundation was established. It was again an initiative of East West Institute, the think tank from uh, New York, USA, and it was supported by the Charles Sturt Moss Foundation, which is uh, actually one of the largest private foundations United States, and at that time, uh, the foundation was supporting a lot of different initiatives, uh, mainly related to democratization process and development processes in the former communist countries. The foundation was built on belief that support of democratic principles, economic development, cross-border cooperation, and inter-ethnic collaboration on a local and regional level <coughs> is the bottom line of building a stable and democratic Europe. So, this region is, is the home region of the initiative I'm going to talk about. Carpathian Foundation was um, establishing its strategy based on the needs uh, which, which we're hearing um, in, in all five countries we were operating in. And the main um, area of intervention were grant programs supporting local grassroots initiatives and uh, initiatives of, of local people. Uh, there were also programs providing technical assistance education and, and uh, other kind of help. And also we were a facilitator of networking, networking between different sectors, I mean NGOs, state, and the business, and also uh, networking across the borders uh, between those countries, those five countries I was mentioning. The main target groups were the clients of the, of the foundation, <coughs> uh, local NGOs, different kinds of NGOs, 
local self-governments and uh, of course their coalitions with the, the local stakeholders. Or all our grant programs or technical assistance programs were um, somehow built uh, with the condition that everyone who is asking for help from us should be able to, to cooperate on a local level, should be able to, to establish a local coalition because uh, for us it was very important to support the initiatives which had a chance uh, to be sustainable and to remain uh, in the place uh, even after the financial support from the, from the foundation had. The period between 1994 and 2006 uh, was a period when Foundation was operating as an international organization, which means that uh, it was governed by the international board of directors. We had 15 members. Uh, I'm mentioning that here because it was really a unique thing, putting together five countries, putting together an international structure where uh, even in the in the leadership of the foundation, people had to had to learn how to cooperate, had to learn how to talk to each other. Of course, we were facing uh, challenges like five different languages. There were there was no common language. Those people who, who are far away from that part of Europe might think that all these people can talk, uh, talk in one language together, which is, which is uh, definitely not true. So everything, every meeting was, uh, was uh, translated into, into five languages, and there was one uh, common language, English, which was uh, kind of uniting all of us. But of course, in case we went uh, out to the community, By the, by the local people. So the International Board of Directors was uh, consisting of 10 people from the region, always two representatives from, uh, from each country, and we were also involving some, uh, some external experts from Western Europe or, or from the US. Uh, those uh, people were serving us um, teachers, assistants, uh, facilitators. We were basically learning from them how to do the, the, the whole thing, how to start the The executive part of the foundation was consisting on um, the headquarters office, which was uh, situated in Slovakia, like for me, I'm from Slovakia, and uh, the five uh, national offices, which uh, were led by, by local country directors. So the foundation was present in all five uh, national regions uh, in the Carpathian Euro region. In 2006, we, we got to the point that uh, <coughs> The international structure we are maintaining is, is probably no longer uh, important or, or it's no longer useful for us. So we started to, to make the, the, the Carpathian Net uh, Foundation Network a little bit more broken. Uh, the local offices or the national, national country offices uh, were empowered to start to build their own strategy and uh, to, to work independently. And this was also uh, connected uh, with uh, um, slowly losing our international donor who was, who was financing the whole project. Uh, I would like to mention here that most of the American and Western uh, European donors who came uh, to, to these countries after the political changes had a plan to contribute to development of democracy, uh, local development, contribute to, to, to all the uh, networking processes and development local indigenous organizations, but they had a clear, clear vision that in a certain moment they will just leave and they, they, they will let these organizations to, to work and operate on, the, on their own. It was, supposed, uh, uh, it was supposed to be developed enough uh, to, to be able to sustain and to be, to be able to operate independently. Uh, here I would like to mention just uh, three, three important dates. Uh, uh, in 2004, just before uh, these changes, um, Slovakia and three other countries of the Carpathian Euro region entered the European Union as a full members. So uh, from that moment, we were considered to be a developed country uh, which uh, should be able to, to, to handle the processes on, on its own. In 2007, uh, Slovakia entered uh, the Schengen uh, Agreement, which of course means a free movement, free, free trade, and, and all these advantages uh, coming from, uh, from this. And in uh, 2009, Slovakia, as the, the only one country from, from all of those mentioned, entered the Eurozone, which means that we are, we are those who are 
to the Bureau of the local currency instead of our, our previous currency. All these dates were very important and, and are somehow connected with, with, with this, what I'm, what I'm trying to explain now. Kavitian Foundation Slovakia today uh, is a slightly different uh, organization than it was before because it's not anymore um, concentrating on facilitation of cross-border cooperation because with open borders and, and with all these advantages uh, coming with the, the European Union membership, it just uh, became least important because people, organizations, uh, communities can get together very easily and they don't need our facilitation, our help uh, anymore. Uh, however, we are still providing financial support, we are still providing training, and we are still providing a helping hand to local people, local organizations, local indigenous groups, which are trying to, to, to solve their local problems. And, and they are doing it uh, using their uh, own resources, and, and they just need a little bit of help from an outside um, organization like the Kavitian Foundation. Our flagship teams uh, the, in the last couple of years community-based poverty alleviation, and uh, we are also concentrating on the development of concept of corporate social responsibility, which is basically a very new topic in uh, our part of the world. We still support local collaboration, we still uh, help uh, building local partnerships, and we are trying to engage uh, those um, uh, types of organizations which were not that much involved in Our very new and important uh, direction or interest is <coughs> Ukraine and uh, special attention to, to Ukrainian communities which are close to the border. Of course, Slovakia is bordering with Ukraine, um, actually from the place where our office is located, it's only 100 kilometers uh, to get to, to, to Ukraine. So it's, so it's less than one hour driving and we really feel that that part of the world uh, needs a special attention Let me mention a couple of um, special projects we are, we are uh, concentrating on, uh, especially the last two or three years, and uh, the areas we are, we are uh, trying, to, trying to help the local communities. Uh, one project is called Trampoline, and uh, it was basically designed to tackle poverty, and especially social poverty in the region. Social poverty in our meaning means not just uh, poverty in financial terms, but poverty of uh, bad access to information, bad access to education, um, different uh, or, or a lower opportunities for certain, certain groups, certain, certain uh, parts of the population. One of these uh, vulnerable, vulnerable groups we are feeling that really need our help and our assistance are young people who are graduating from school, finding themselves in a job market without uh, a real possibility to get a good job. It's mainly because uh, they just come out from the school without any experience, without any practical hands-on experience. And of course, all of the companies, all of the organizations are looking for young, educated, and experienced people. So this is, this is a kind of paradox, and, and we started to deal with this problem. <coughs> this project is, is one of the initiatives, and uh, its main goal is to increase chances of young people in the job market, especially by development of their skills, competencies, and experience. And uh, we are also trying to in engage local employers into this project, first of all, to help them understand where the problem is, and to help them uh, uh, enter this problem in a very um, proactive, proactive way. And of course, the whole project goes with a uh, with uh, huge public awareness campaign. We are talking about that. We are involved in government officials because uh, we feel that we are not strong enough to, to handle the situation by ourselves. And we really need to build a very strong coalition to, to be able to solve this. <coughs> 
the activities which are kind of concrete steps we do in the framework of this project are uh, training uh, mainly uh, oriented to presentation skills, writing of resumes, CVs, preparation for the job interview. We are um, actually involving agents, special agencies uh, and head, head hunting companies who are, who are in fact cooperating with the uh, local businesses searching for, for new employees. So it's kind of a, a process facilitated by us where everyone who can somehow help and contribute is taking, taking part. Another very important part of the project is um, our, our local internships. Um, because of no skills, <coughs> It's very important to say that the scholarship programs we have are sponsored by the uh, local companies. Um, we are very happy that we were <coughs> able to engage local companies in the other programs and, uh, and we were able to, able to get some very concrete help from, from their side, uh, which means money. Uh, it's important to say that in Slovakia it's, it's very difficult uh, because Slovakia doesn't have tax incentives. part of the program is uh, volunteering. We really believe that all the students who are uh, enjoying the help of the, of the foundation needs to contribute and needs to uh, somehow pay back what they are getting. And uh, on the other hand, it's uh, also a way uh, how we are trying to motivate them to stay in the region and not leave. So uh, helping them to develop their relationship to the community mentioning the concept of corporate social responsibility. Uh, this is a very new topic. 
topic in the region, and um, uh, we are consider ourselves pioneers in, in Eastern Slovakia. Uh, here I would like to mention that being uh, an Eastern Slovakian means really being disadvantaged, and this is uh, publicly outspoken <laughs> everywhere in Slovakia. Because if you imagine the, 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 the map of Slovakia, the capital is situated in the very western part, close to Austria. It's more close to Vienna than anything else. And Eastern Slovakia is just on the opposite part of the, of the country, which means far away from, from information, far away from opportunities. This region was always lagging behind the others. There is still no highway connecting the, uh, the, the capital with the with, uh, uh, Eastern Slovakian region. So it's really um, a kind of unique situation in a very negative, a negative meaning. Um, that's why we are really happy that there are a couple of companies who are cooperating with us to say that one of our first partners was U.S. Steel, which is a U.S. company based in Bakery Košice, and, and they were our, our major partner since 2007 in, in all these programs, and they are considered to be a, a, a flagship of corporate social responsibility in the country, not just in, in, in Eastern Slovakia. What we do with the, with the businesses, we are trying to um, initiate discussions and, uh, and uh, we are trying to put together different stakeholders to, to talk about that and to explain why uh, development of this concept is important and why it's beneficial for the companies and also for the, for the community. What we usually, what we were doing in the beginning, we were trying to, to, to bring um, experts from abroad to talk about the topic uh, in front of the local businesses, but right now we are already in a situation that we can use the local businesses own example and, uh, and who are actually um, trying to motivate uh, the smaller ones to join the club and to, and to help and to, to contribute to, to all these efforts. Um, of course, it's always very important to, to, to do it uh, in, in many different ways. Uh, we uh, are awarding the best partners in the community annually. This picture is actually from uh, the 20th <coughs> anniversary of the Targeti Foundation that we were awarding. 10 local businesses in different categories. And we are very proud of them, and, and, and we are advertising them in, in every possible moment, and, and we'll be at it for two, because we are very, very happy to, to, to be uh, in this club with them. I was mentioning Ukraine uh, as, as an important partner where our help and, and our, our interest go. Uh, this project, uh, which is the last one I would like to talk about, is uh, called Truly Together. And it's basically um, trying to, to transfer the best uh, practices and experiences from, from Slovak communities to Ukraine, especially regarding integrated rural community development. Ukraine is a very rural country with couple of, a couple of large cities. And we feel that the, the environment uh, there is pretty much uh, uh, the same like So the project was uh, was designed um, as as a project to, to transfer everything uh, we know and everything we can share with them. Uh, the project is supported by the official uh, Slovak uh, governmental help, which is a which is a special program, a special pool of money, which Slovakian government devoted to to this uh, to, to this uh, assistance programs towards towards Ukraine. The activities of the project are including a micro-grant scheme, which means that we are awarding uh, small grants to local uh, community development NGOs uh, in Ukraine, and we are, we are doing that using uh, our um, mechanism of, of grant making, which was used in Slovakia for, for so many years. And we are, of course, uh, doing all the due diligence and, and observing the performance of project periods. We also organized a study visit of uh, selected um, representatives of different NGOs, uh, uh, governmental and semi-governmental organizations from Ukraine, and also from local businesses. Uh, they visited Slovak communities where uh, there was something to, to, to share or to be, to be proud of, so they, they had a chance to, to, to see the achievements of, of the local, local projects uh, for 
personally uh, on the spot. Uh, we also collected a couple of uh, good case studies and best practices and reported them in uh, Ukraine and Slovakia and Finland at the end of the project. And actually, the conference, uh, which is the last part, is going to happen in two weeks. <coughs> I'm just very sad that I'm here and I cannot be there and, and, and see how, how the whole project will be discussed and, and, and uh, what the governmental officials from both sides of the border will, will say to, 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 to all the achievements we, we made. So this is pretty much everything I wanted to share with you today. And uh, I'm very open for <coughs> questions, comments, good <coughs> advices, anything. that you give a lot of grants. Uh, however, you're depending basically on um, you know, uh, donations. So are there like any other resources of income for the foundation? Do you do fundraising? And if so, what kind of like, fundraising, fundraising activities do you do? Sure. Uh, foundation is, uh, the foundation is, is uh, diversifying its, its sources of income and its, its supporters. Uh, grant programs are a very special category because uh, uh, grant money or money devoted to regranting can uh, come only from very particular resources. Right now, uh, those are only the small and, and, and medium size or big, but we don't really have really big businesses in the, in the region because other sources which are available are not, uh, uh, we, we simply cannot use them for regranting. Other sources, by other sources, Those are uh, mm, designed uh, in a way that they should be used for particular projects and spent by the applicant or, or the, the granting organization, but they cannot be, cannot be used for, for the help for the third parties. So what we 
basically do, we do uh, local fundraising at the local companies and individuals. This income is used for uh, grant programs and this is basically creating the grant budgets. And the rest of our work consisting of technical assistance, networking, uh, partnership development, and, and dealing with, uh, with special topics like poverty alleviation and uh, corporate social responsibility development concepts, those would be covered from the project level. And we are basically writing grant applications uh, to different European Union supporting programs for other sources. In Slovakia and, and um, the countries around us are quite lucky that we got uh, another opportunity. There is a so-called Norwegian financial mechanism, which is basically created by the government of, of, of Norwegia, Iceland, and uh, Liechtenstein. These countries didn't join the European Union, so they are not contributing to the EU budget, but the obligation is to, to create something of benefit. So this program is also available in Slovakia and also Poland, Hungary, and Czech, Czech Republic. Unfortunately, it's still uh, not available in Europe. Um, you mentioned the CS Smart Foundation was one of the first donors. How long was that period of time that they gave to because I'm interested in that transition for you as a network to, because you were obviously dependent on that funding. Like, how did you find your operational costs after that? Mm -hmm. Thank you for the question. I think it's a very good question. Actually, the most of the donors were coming to to uh, communist former communist countries uh, with a plan to stay for ten years. Right. That was the that was the plan. But of course, the development and uh, and um, um, all the processes. Longer in some countries, a little uh, shorter in other countries. Uh, unfortunately, Slovakia particularly uh, got a very bad political period in 1998 uh, during the Prime Minister Mečiar, uh, who basically started a very tough and strong campaign against the NGOs of such and, and the sector, the third sector of such, and we, we got to. to situation that uh, all the foreign donors uh, started to mobilize themselves and they put a lot of additional funds to, to, to this country uh, just to uh, help the sector to, to, to resist and to, to, to fight and to survive somehow in, in those bad conditions. Uh, it's um, not a secret <coughs> that most of the American and Western European foundations supported a huge voters campaign, uh, especially involving uh, the first voters and, and young people just to participate and to make the elections democratic and, and contributing to, to the democratic changes changes in the country. Actually, the, the, the whole campaign was very similar to the one we heard uh, from uh, from Kazbek uh, during his peer-to-peer -peer presentation. It was, it was a huge mobilization campaign. And everyone who was somehow involved with, uh, with NGOs and the non-profits uh, was, uh, was uh, trying to to maintain the, the, the freedom and the democracy mm -hmm. we were fighting for, for, for strong before. So the 10 years was a plan. Uh, the, the final goodbye was uh, after 16 years from the beginning. And uh, it was happening slowly. Uh, in the first years, we were getting quite a lot of money. It was actually, uh, the help was covering all our grant programs. We didn't have other sources of income for supporting the grant budgets and, and also our, our own existence and performance in the region. But of course the donor uh, uh, tried to make it uh, in a way so we uh, slowly adapt to the local situation and to the hard situation uh, which was waiting for us and, and uh, the help was, was smaller and smaller every year. So the last three or four years were really kind of symbolic. Unfortunately not all the countries are, are really prepared Transparent. 
human vision, so I guess you have more opportunities to receive funding from the European Union. And what's the percentage probably in the total budget that you are having right now in, in the foundation? And second, I'm also curious about the projects that you implemented for the Roma population in particular. Do you have any focusing on this, on this population? Thank you. Um, European Union has plenty of different programs and, and plenty of different budgets. Of course, Carpathian Foundation is not running for, for everything because most of the support of the European Union is devoted to infrastructure development and, and uh, um, um, maybe the lowering the disparity between different regions mm -hmm. in, in the European Union countries. Uh, these uh, budgets or these programs are usually, usually more interesting or open uh, for local or for local <coughs> businesses. So we are not really touching those, uh, but of course the, the, the biggest amounts of, of resources are located in those programs. Carpathian Foundation particularly is usually looking for programs which are known by DG Employment Social Affairs mm -hmm. and Equal Opportunity. This is the DG which is dealing basically with those topics uh, uh, which are closest to, to us, power segregation, resilient people, involving businesses, development of partnerships, so usually these, these programs are, are kind of open for us and, and we run for the support from them. Um, <coughs> if I look at the budget, uh, it's, it's about 20-25% uh, of our budget, which is coming from, from these projects. But of course it's a normal process, like we look to um, call for proposal, we apply for a grant, and then it's uh, a competition whether we get or not get one. We are um, in, in a very good situation because of our international network. Mm -hmm. So most of the programs uh, which are requiring cross-border cooperation or cooperation with other countries uh, are, are very good for us because we, during the 20 years, we were able to, to develop a very good and very vital network of organizations uh, in different fields. So it's usually not a problem for us. We are well recognized and, and we consider to be a good and responsible partner in the, in the region. So we are very lucky in, in, in being able to, to create those local partnerships. Because this is usually the, the, the most difficult part of in project, project development. And getting back uh, to your second question, Roma population, it's, it's a huge issue in Slovakia. And, uh, and I was just delivering a presentation at Simo Siegel maybe two months ago, particularly about, mm -hmm. about this topic. And I was actually thinking of uh, coming with the same uh, topic to, to, to today's presentation, but then I changed my mind because this is a little bit uh, broader and gives you uh, a better picture of the whole overall situation. Uh, Roma population is, is creating about 17% uh, of the population in Slovakia right now, and most of the Roma are, are located in Eastern Slovakia. So this is something we just have to take into consideration all the time when we develop our projects, when we, when we uh, prepare or, or execute our, our assistance programs. Um, we had a special program called Romanet, which was supporting a cooperation between different Roma organizations within the country and also across the border. It was very successful and, and it was, uh, I would say, probably the only program of this kind in, 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 that, in that region. And uh, it empowered a lot of Roma organizations and, and helped them to break out from, from the circle they were, they were staying in because it was supporting uh, transfer of experience, uh, learning from each other. So this program was very successful, but the program was supported by the, by the Charter Mod Foundation, and it's extremely difficult to fundraise for the Roma topic from other sources. This is not a secret. Uh, Roma population is, is still uh, perceived as, as, a, as a negative factor in development of the country, and there is no company who could, who could support Roma programs. We are working hard on it, but, but it's, I think it will take, take some time. What we really do uh, and, and we, we, we want to uh, do in the future is a kind of positive discrimination regarding uh, Roma organizations and Roma individuals. So we make sure that in all the programs, I mentioned the trampoline, I mentioned the scholarship programs, we, we always make sure that, that at least a certain percentage of the students uh, who are involved in the project are coming from the, from the Roma members. In the beginning of your presentation, you mentioned that uh, human rights organizations uh, acted negatively in the freedom of speech. Why did you think this way? And how you are working with uh, human rights? 
rights organizations now? Or do, do you have special funds for this kind of human rights organization uh, as the beginning of your funding? Or the situation in mm -hmm. the uh, Human rights organizations are considered to be very strong in, in Slovakia in, in the terms of being prepared to tackle a problem like yours to, and to deal with the issues. But most of them are one more difference that I want to mention. Mostly foundations here uh, in the United States or in Western Europe are usually having their endowments. And the, the, the interest from endowment uh, is, is usually the, the source of income for the grant programs. This, this money is, is usually feeding the grant programs. This is not happening in Slovakia. Uh, foundations are not having endowments. These are not family foundations. These are not foundations uh, created with a, with a big pool of money. So it's, it's really a struggle year by year to fundraise, you put together the grant budget, and then you distribute the money. And another year, it's just starting uh, again and again. Uh, so it's kind of kind of never-ending process, and it's sometimes really frustrating. But coming back to, uh, to the tax incentives, of course, uh, using our, uh, using all the possibilities we are trying to, to advocate for uh, introducing uh, tax incentives into Slovak legislature. But this is something which is taking time. And right now, we are not really, really sure that, that this will happen. That's why we are working with the local businesses. And what we do is simply we are, we are showing them uh, our programs. We are showing them the need, which is obvious. You don't have to be a genius to, to, to find out that there is a need for supporting of, of this community activity. And we are just trying to invite them and involve, involve them through cooperation. And I have to say that uh, why I value without any uh, side interest or without any side motivation to do that. Uh, of course, I believe that those uh, businesses uh, which are already cooperating with us and they already know that we are doing a great job and, and we can do that together, they will remain with us also in the moment that some kind of tax incentives or, or some kind of state help will be, will be introduced. But then the work
the African gypsies, mm -hmm. um, they, they are not in one place. They move about. So we have a program at home. I know it's a government initiative. We call the nomadic education. Mm -hmm. I don't know if uh, the government in uh, Brazil has any such thing where you take kids, work with them, and the government schools, uh, public initiatives get to facilitate how we could reach some of these communities. I see them very much like the way the Romans uh, mm -hmm. function. And maybe you could just talk more on that. Mm -hmm. We'll find some information on that. Sure. On the nomadic thing. It might, it might have something or the other to apply to how you could uh, use the Roman uh, nomads. Sure. Thank you for the question. Actually, it's a very good question. Uh, the Roma population in Slovakia is not nomadic anymore. Okay. This is a very important bottom line. I think it was, I don't remember now the date, I might be wrong, but it was sometime in the 70s where uh, a new legislation appeared in, in Slovakia which was prohibiting the nomadic uh, way of life. Mm -hmm. So it basically made uh, the Roma population <coughs> settled and, and stay in the, in the designated places, let's call them like that. It was mostly outside of the, of the villages, outside of the towns, in, uh, in the special, special areas uh, which uh, usually didn't have enough uh, or pr uh, proper infrastructure, roads, access to drinking water, and all these all this, uh, important things. Uh, but these people were, were kind of kept in their places. Then there was another way, uh, wave of, of, of changes, which was trying to, put, uh, to bring the Roma population to the cities, to the, to the communities, and assimilate them uh, among the other population, which was also not very, very positive with this. They were simply not able to change their lifestyle from one day to another, which is obvious, and, and this is creating uh, uh, huge problems between the majority and the, and the my, uh, minority because of their different lifestyle, which is so much uh, uh, not in favor of, of, of the majority. So basically, this, uh, all these steps and all these changes contributed very heavily to a negative attitude of the, of the majority population towards them. And actually, this is something we have to handle now. And being honest, I don't really know uh, anyone who was, uh, uh, came out uh, in the past with a program which would, uh, which would uh, um, handle all these problems and which would come with a recipe how to, how to solve it. This is probably a process which will take uh, a long time. And, and we all have to be patient and wait, wait uh, until, until um, uh, things will be moving. What we are doing is we try to work them on the community level, involve them to everything, what we, what we do, what we organize, what we provide to others. And as I mentioned, the positive discrimination is something which is pretty natural for us. And, and we really believe that all of these people are able to, to contribute and all of these people are able to be just like the others. They just need to have, uh, need to get the opportunity. And maybe, maybe we need to be a little bit more We have to be able to invest a little bit more time and resources into, into this process to, to uh, solve these problems. I personally am I'm very close to them. Uh, my mom, uh, she used to be a kindergarten teacher in the Roma uh, kindergarten, which was located in one of those ghettos, uh, just surrounded by the, by, the, by the Roma community. So I really had a chance to see the insights of their life, and, uh, and I know that they are contributing different culture, different uh, um, values which are not coming from the, uh, from the majority. And unfortunately, because of the social situation, those values and those, those brilliant things are slowly disappearing because, because they are just not able to, to maintain their culture in these difficult circumstances. So it's really, it's really sad. Um, Thank you. Thank you very much for your very pointed and very clear presentation.
covering most of the, the, the first semester, and I think uh, the leadership seminar was basically the best uh, opportunity to improve ourselves, to be able to serve better, and to be able to work better in the future. I really feel empowered, and I really feel changed in, in, in that way. I believe I will be a better leader. I will, I will be able to, to, uh, to work with my team uh, uh, even more effectively and more efficiently in, in the future. Uh, and I will be able to, to get the most of each, uh, out of each individual who is, who is a member of the team. So I think, yeah, I, I, I feel uh, a huge improvement and a really big privilege to be able to be part of this group and, and, and to go through all this.